This morning, uh, I've entitled this sermon, Ride on King Jesus. If you remember the start of the week, this holy week that we celebrate of Christ, it started with Jesus riding into the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey. And uh, we're going to pick up this story and this truth of this experience that Jesus had with his disciples and a crowd of people as he marched into Jerusalem with millions of people that were gathered there for Passover. Matthew 21, starting with verse 1, let's read together. It says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say to the Lord, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gently and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of the donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to set on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Have you ever had one of those weeks that starts out great, but by the time you get to the end of the week, things have gone really badly? That's a little bit of what Jesus experienced here in the last week of his life before he found himself nailed to a cross. Toward the end of the week, Thursday evening, we see Jesus gathering with his disciples in this upper room, this large room that had been prepared for them to experience and observe the Passover celebration and the meal together. And as they ate that night, Jesus did something a little strange with the disciples. He said, Hey, so this unleavened bread, would you break that? Tonight I want you to think of my, my body that is broken for you. And tonight when you drink that wine, I want you to think of it as my blood that is offered to you, poured out to you. And I want you to remember this, and I want you to do this again and again and again until I come back to be with you once again. Jesus also shared several prophecies with the disciples that night. One of them, he, he told Judas what he was going to be doing later that evening. He, he told Peter what was about to happen in his life as well. The Bible says that after Jesus and his disciples were, were finished with the Passover observance, Jesus found himself going to the Garden of Gethsemane and the Mount of Olives. While he was there, he prayed. And he prayed, God, if it be your will, please let this cup pass from me, this cup of this, this suffering. But he concluded his prayer by saying, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. While he was there praying, Judas, the betrayer, comes with his band of army, these soldiers that came to arrest Jesus, and Jesus willingly surrendered himself to them. Consequently, because of Jesus doing that, he experienced the most difficult time of his life. He was punished, he was persecuted, he was mocked, he was beaten with a cat of nine tails. And he took all this anguish and he took all this pain for you and for me. By high noon the next day, he was put on a cross and he was hanging there for three hours. A week that started out so well for Jesus ended up costing him his own life. So let's talk a little bit about what happened at the beginning of that week, that Sunday before all the tragedy struck later on that week. This was a Sunday of celebration. 
Everyone had gathered for the Passover, and Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Jesus comes into Jerusalem in a way that everyone will be able to recognize Jesus for who he really is. During a Passover season where people are coming to this city, millions of people are coming to observe what God had done in their lives, of their people, so many, many generations before, and Jesus came along with them. The very first verse of this chapter that we read starts out by saying, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. The first thing we want to notice this morning is that the Lord personally set up the stage so that no one would miss his entry into the city. Jesus set up the stage. He chose this particular Sunday, this particular day, that everyone was gathering into Jerusalem to do what he was about to do so that he himself could ride into town and everyone could see him. Let's be clear, none of this that took place was by accident. It was all completely <coughs> orchestrated, every single detail. Jesus gave some instructions to his disciples. Verse 2, Jesus said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone, verse 3 says, if anyone says to you, uh, says anything to you, say the Lord needs them. Luke's gospel tells us that that, that did happen, that the disciples went to get these animals, and someone, as they were untying them, someone said, what are you doing? Which I get that. If they're my horses, I'd be like, wait a minute, you can't just come in here and take these horses, these donkeys. Um, and the scripture says that they replied, the Lord needs them. And without any further inquiry, they let the animals go. The animals were given to Jesus, as Jesus instructed them to do. Which reminds me, sometimes I think about some of the things that I have in my life. Some of those things that I, I hold close to me. And maybe there's some things in your life as well. Some things that only you know about. And some things that Jesus says, hey, can you just give that to me? Hey, I want to use you in this, in this great way. Hey, I know that this is going to, to cause you to step out of your comfort zone. But, but I promise you, if you give this to me, if you trust this to me by faith, I will do incredible things with it. And I want to encourage us that there are things that Jesus wants for us to be able to use. Um, let's be reminded that anything that he has in his hands are going to, I promise you, be much more effective than anything that we could do on our own. Well, verse 8 says, the very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The book of John tells us that these branches were leafy palm branches, that the people came and, and put them on the road and they said the cloaks were spread on the road as well. And, and why did this happen? The book of John tells us that, that these things happened so that Jesus could have this regal ride into the city. A regal ride. What is a regal ride? What is a royal ride? Well, back in the Old Testament, when a king would have maybe had a victory over an army or maybe when they were coronated they would come riding into town but they wouldn't ride on this big white stallion they would ride on a donkey because a donkey symbolized humility and peace and royalty for example when king jehu was coronated he rode it on a donkey and people spread their cloaks out for him to ride on when king solomon rode into town on his coronation. People had palm branches and they threw those into the streets so that the king could ride on them. So Jesus was entering Jerusalem as into the, into the tradition of the kings of the Old Testament. Not only that, but he started riding on top of Mount, on, on the Mount of Olives. What is so significant about the Mount of Olives? Well, the Mount of Olives wasn't just a place that Jesus would go and pray. The Mount of Olives was, was literally 2,700 feet above the city of Jerusalem. 
So anybody down below could look up at the mountain. They could see what was going on from, from all around. And Jesus could see everything that was happening in the city below. And so everyone could see what Jesus was doing on top of this mountain as he began to descend into the streets of Jerusalem. Jesus was always very strategic about everything that he did, and this was no exception. For now, all eyes are on Jesus as he descends into the city. Why was it so important that Jesus did all this stuff? Was he on some kind of an, an ego trip? Let's take a look at the crowd that Jesus, that had surrounded Jesus at this point. And for that, we have to go back to the previous chapter of chapter 20. And we see this crowd that is forming even before Jesus gets to the Mount of Olives. It says that they were walking next to him. Now, thinking about walking, if you think about it, Jesus, I, the way the scripture interprets this, it tells us that Jesus just pretty much walked just about anywhere that he went. But this particular time, he rode. He rode on this donkey. And so Jesus is there in the Mount of Olives. People are gathering around him. And if that is not enough, there are a couple people there, a couple men that have been blind, possibly by birth they were blind. And, and they had heard that Jesus was coming in their direction. And so they were, they were crying out loud, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And as the crowd was gathering and getting closer to these men that were begging for Jesus to bring healing to them, they tried to quiet them down. But what happened was these, these blind men shouted even the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And we pick this up in Matthew chapter 20, verse 32. It says, Jesus stopped and called to these men. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. So let's get this picture. Jesus is on top of Mount, the Mount of Olives. He has a crowd of people that are behind him and in front of him, plus two guys that had been blind probably all of their lives. Now they can instantly see, and they were, they were willing to shout loudly before Jesus ever got there. So you can imagine the excitement that they added to this crowd. Jesus is on top of this mountain, 2,700 feet above the city of Jerusalem. He's on this donkey, ready to ride, this regal ride into the city that represents humility and peace and royalty. People are throwing cloaks, they're throwing branches, palm branches, in front of Jesus so that he can ride into town. And they're shouting to him, all of this is happening. And why is all this happening? So that Jesus could be noticed, maybe. So that people could finally understand who he really is, perhaps. But I think there was more to it than that. I think one of the biggest reasons that Jesus did everything he did that day was so that he could fulfill the scriptures. So that he could fulfill the promises that God had laid before them. Number two, the Lord purposely showcased the scriptures. Verse four tells us this. It says, this all took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Jesus was always very intentional about what he did, not just because he had a good idea. He did it so that he could fulfill the scriptures, fulfill the prophecies from centuries ago. And I know we could sit here this morning and go, well, anybody could, could have looked up those prophecies and they could have calculated everything just right and, and they could have done the same thing. So anybody could ride a donkey down into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Yeah, but here's the thing. Anybody could do that, but Jesus was chosen to do that. And of course, there are many prophecies about the Messiah that would come into this world from Genesis all the way to Malachi. And if we go back to the previous book, we find 
a prophet by the name of Zechariah, and he's prophesying about what is taking place on the Sunday that Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. Zechariah 9, 9 says, Rejoice, great daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Centuries before Jesus was born, this prophecy spoke of one that would come on this donkey and ride into Jerusalem when everyone was gathered there, riding on this donkey in this specific way. And now Jesus fulfills this scripture. Why does he do that? Because he wants everyone to know that every promise that God has made he will fulfill those promises. He will keep those promises. God will always do what he promises to do. If he speaks it, he will bring it to pass. Paul says this about the promises of God in 2 Corinthians 1.20. It says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. In other words, God's promises didn't stop with the prophecies of old. They didn't stop at the, at the cross when Jesus died. It's because Jesus fulfilled the promises of his Father that we can stand on God's promises for our lives today. All we have to do is hold on to God's unchanging hand. All we have to do is hold on to the providence of God and what he has ordained for our, for our lives to live. That's how we can always have hope in our heart because we always know that God is going before us. He is always leading us. He always has that opportunity to work in and through our lives in the way that he wants to if we will fully surrender to him. And Jesus was fully surrendered to his Father. So Jesus was very strategic about doing what he was doing. He was doing what his Father had always called him to do. And because Jesus was able to fulfill those promises, we can trust in the promises of God. God's promises are trustworthy and true, not based upon our circumstances, not based upon the past. They're based upon faith. They're based upon our faith in Jesus Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith. And the writer of Hebrews says that faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. Some of us need to be reminded of scriptures such as what Paul writes in Galatians 6, 9, when he says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Just another one of the promises of God. <coughs> Jesus did all that he did to fulfill everything the Bible says that he was going to do. And he did it through his son, Jesus Christ. So the question we have this morning is, Am I living according to the word of God, or do I just say that I believe? I mean, anybody can say that they believe in the Bible, but are we living according to it? As Jesus rides this donkey into town, he's setting the stage for Scripture to be revealed and to be fulfilled. And out of that, number three, the Lord's people shout for their Savior. Why are they doing this? Because they're seeing Jesus ride into town and they're thinking about the ministry of Jesus and recognizing that Jesus isn't just another rabbi. Jesus is this promised Messiah. Jesus is this King of kings and Lord of lords. And when you're in the presence of a king, you don't just stand there and watch him go by. You, you have to interact. You want to do something. So they're, they're throwing their cloaks and they're throwing palm branches and they're waving them and they're shouting. And all that's taking place is taking place because they know that in their heart, if Jesus fulfilled all the promises of the prophecies that were given centuries ago, then this same Messiah can fulfill every promise that is made in their lives ahead and what God has promised them for their future. So in verse 9, we see that the crowd that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. 
And while they were following, they were waving these palm branches and they were, they were quoting this verse Hosanna out of Psalm 118. It reminds me, interesting enough, the word Hosanna itself means save now. Hosanna means save now, but they weren't just crying Hosanna, right? They were saying Hosanna to the son of David. So they were no longer just crying out for God to save them. They were focused in on Jesus Christ. Hosanna, son of David. Save us now, King Jesus. Amen. And they were asking Jesus to save them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. But what they were really crying out for, what Jesus really came to do, was to save them from the bondage of sin that ruled in their heart so that he could come and free them, allow them to live the life that God had intended for them to live and each one of us to live. Which helps us to recognize what does Palm Sunday have to do with our lives today. And for that, we have to go back to another prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. Back at the time that he started the beginning of his ministry, you remember that prophecy that was given. A prophecy that Jesus spoke himself. Remember when he was baptized and the Spirit came down and descended on Jesus in the form of a dove. When the skies opened up and God said, sent his blessing to his son and then Jesus walked into the wilderness and was tempted for 40 days and he never succumbed to the temptations that the devil put on him. And Jesus walks back into his hometown in the town of Nazareth intentionally on that specific day of that Sabbath. And he walks into the synagogue and he's handed this scroll, this prophecy from Isaiah. Luke records it in chapter 4. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus came and lived and died and rose again for all of this to happen. And while Jesus was here, not only did he do all of that, but he established his church. So, so this same message that Jesus proclaimed through all of his ministry would continue to be proclaimed through his church. That we would continue to proclaim it today. Just as the prophet Isaiah proclaimed what was going to happen, just as Jesus unfolded those, unrolled that scroll and read it that day when he began his ministry in the synagogue 2,000 years ago, the mantle of that promise and of that hope and of that ministry to the community and to the world in which we live, that mantle has been handed to us. Amen. We are to continue to proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ that speaks of the cross and the resurrection, that speaks of a heaven eternal that speaks of the power of God that can dwell within us and transform the very lives that we Amen. And that's our opportunity. So Jesus rode into Jerusalem. He was willing to endure the pain. He was willing to die on the cross because he knew that this message of the love the Father had given to him for all of the world could be something that could be manifest in our lives. And we could proclaim it and we could share it by example to all of those that we come in contact with. Not because of who we are, but because of what Jesus Christ was willing to do. And because the power of His Spirit leads us forward and transforms our lives in the process and allows other people to come into tune with Jesus Christ for themselves. Listen, we could come to church every Sunday, but if we're going to be the church, we have to continue to let this light shine into our communities, into our world. We have to continue to open our doors to all of those that are searching and seeking for the will of God to be accomplished in their lives, just like we were looking for something more and somebody told us about it. And God wants us to continue to be that voice. It's good news, folks. That's what the gospel means. It's, it's a proclamation of everything that God has done and has promised to do. And we get to share that message. 
of hope with people around us. And we can do it together. And the Spirit of God is moving us forward and opening those opportunities for us to declare that. So it's an exciting day to be alive. It's an exciting to shout Hosanna to the one who made it all possible. And next Sunday, we do get to come back and celebrate the resurrection that sealed it forever. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, as we close together this morning? God, we thank you for your son. We knew what he was doing, Amen. and he did it anyway. That he got up out of that garden, and before he could even finish his prayer, the betrayal was upon him. The scene had been set. The process of his life that he had had for 33 years, as he knew, it, was about to be over. But he knew that it had purpose. And he was willing to do it anyway. And he rode into town. And he experienced all that he did because he had us in mind. And just as King Jesus rode into Jerusalem all those many years ago, he has promised that he is going to ride back triumphantly to receive us so that we can experience him for our very own, for all of eternity. Thank you, God, that this story does not end. And we're right in the middle of it. And we are a part of it. We are the characters that play the lives of the people around us through the same love that was given and demonstrated through the Son of Jesus Christ. And we get to proclaim that. We get to live that out. We get to express that and share that with others. Because it offers hope. And it offers new life. It offers an opportunity for people to experience a life that they have never even dreamed about. To be able to do all that we could ever ask or imagine that goes beyond ourselves. Thank you, God, that we're not in this alone and that we get to do it together and that you go before us and open up these doors of opportunity. So, God, I pray that you would be help us to be reminded of the celebration that we have even yet today to proclaim something that was prophesied so many generations and centuries ago. Something that Jesus came and fulfilled when he was here. And he's ever interceding for us on our behalf even now so that it will continue to go forward. Help us to be faithful. Help us to continue to represent him well so that others will want to come and learn more about this Jesus of Nazareth that changed the world as we know it. That changed all of everything for centuries to come, for as long as you tarry. God, help us to be the voice. Help us to be the example. Help us to be the hands and the feet and the heart of Jesus Christ wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Please come back at 10 o'clock next Sunday, if not before, and we'll celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ again.